Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Nature Conservancy's Lunch and Learn today. We're really excited to do our third edition of our non-operating landowner owner series. So this is geared towards those people who own land, it might be farmland or not, and who are interested in um, improving habitat on their property. We're really excited today to have both Chris Lenhart with us. Chris is a landowner in Defiance County, Ohio, and he also happens to be a farmer advocate for conservation. And then we also have Josh Ember with us. He is a technician at the Williams Soil and Water Conservation District, so he helps landowners who would like to um, explore the idea of taking their farmland into conservation practices. And he also happens to be a landowner who is in the process of doing it himself. So the format for today will be, Chris will start off and he'll talk about the um, excitement and importance of creating habitat on your property. And then we'll turn it over to Josh who will talk about the procedures that someone might wanna go to and some of the resources that are available for people who are interested in doing that. So I will uh, let Chris share his screen and we will go from there. Okay, thanks Stephanie. Load up my presentation here. Uh, all right, let's see. Oh, is that appearing okay? Mm. Looks good. All right. So yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the uh, opportunities for uh, creating habitat for wildlife and use some examples from our own farm, uh, which is located in uh, Northeast Defiance County. Here's a picture of our Century Farm sign there. and. Um, buffer with some wildflowers pollinator habitat there on the left. Um, that's just an outline. I'll talk a little bit about why it's important, what types of wildlife we're talking about, where you can do um, plantings and habitat improvements, and a little bit on how as well. And I'll be talking about <laughs> these are just some examples, not all these all these things you would be planting for, trying to establish habitat for, but some common wildlife in our area, you know, with a you know, coyotes, deer, muskrat beavers in some of the wetter areas of so those kind of uh, or in the wetlands and, and things and then you know a lot of it's for uh, birds perhaps uh, habitat for birds especially um, wetland restoration but also you know forest management um, and all right yeah we'll talk about uh, here uh you know using native plants um, landscaping for wildlife is you know native uh, animals eh, and wildlife prefer a native plant cover and uh, you know, often they require it for different parts of their life cycle to survive and kind of carry on. So we're generally talking about um, planting nat native, both herbaceous and shrubs and trees in different settings uh, that can provide habitat for, you know, different different kinds of wildlife. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, just some of the advantages quick on that, you know, are they, in addition to supporting native wildlife, they are often less maintenance because they're adapted to the local soil and climate, you know, and so if you get them in there, if an don't require as much work as something that isn't, you know, adapted to the local environment. Um, all right, it can also, you know, these projects can also be to support more uh, rare species. Um, in addition to the common ones I mentioned, a lot of times if you're re just restoring prairies and grasslands in Northwest Ohio, there's not a whole ton of that habitat around anymore. And so even just by the act of doing that, some you're often to have some, uh, you know, rare, uh, anim, uh, plant species, generally uh, some animals, but mm, yeah, all right. Let me talk about, yeah, like I said prairie plants and trees, some of the reasons, some of the why, um, you know, more recently, you know, it's not really new anymore, but um, yeah, in the last 10, 10 years or so, people have been doing a lot more plantings for pollinators. So, you know, birds, butterflies, uh, bees, because uh, they support a lot of the you know, um, reproduction of the plant community, um, from pollinating some more, you know, like uh, crops and fruit and nuts species. Also are, you know, attractive uh, aesthetically. And so there's that additional reason. A lot of times when people do native plantings, they tend to kind of over overload it with a, a colorful flowering species just because it is more attractive and interesting. Um, there's ways you can do that so that you have flowering plants through the year. I'll show a slide on that as well. 
while these species do prefer open sun, you know, prairie species, there are plants that, you know, thrive in the shade as well. So, you know, if you talk to you know, local experts like at the SWCD or other places, they can give you advice on what to plant um, in, you know, whether it's sunny or shady. As an example, kind of a list of native plants. Um, now here it gives a common name like Golden Alexander. Now give the scientific name as well uh, beneath it, uh, which is helpful. And when you're dealing with nurseries and things, because sometimes the common names overlap, there's actually many common names for the same species, or they use a different common name in different parts of the country. So it, it's you don't need to know these, but it's helpful to know that you might need a, somebody to specify that if you're going to buy the exactly the right plant. Um, <clears throat> And what this graph here shows is just, you know, some of these plants bloom uh, in May, some midsummer, some late summer. If you plant a variety of species that bloom throughout the year, then you can have, you know, colorful kind of pollinator garden that has blooming flowers throughout the whole year and not just, you know, in the spring or summer. Um, so, so a lot of the habitat work is about, you know, tree plantings, much of Northwest Ohio is forest. Um, there's a picture of a tree planting on the back of our farm in Defiance that this is from a while ago, it's about 14 years ago. Many of those trees now are about you know 20 feet high. Um, there's just some examples of native species of oaks, sugar maple, basswood, tulip poplar, poplar is a fast growing one that um, it's good to plant in open fields because it, it'll you know just grow up quickly. Um, there's also a variety of, of shrubs which are good for you know wildlife and uh, uh, you can plant them in masses and they grow quicker. Uh, so maybe a little hardier in some ways, uh, shorter woody plants, basically. Um, now, wetland restoration is another way you can uh, provide habitat for wildlife. This is done, you know, probably less, certainly less frequently than just doing a native planting, but they have very large benefits. You know, if these wet areas provide habitat for waterfowl, and uh, sandhill cranes, uh, you know, certain raptors, muskrats. Um, there's a picture of our wetland on our farm out in uh, Northeast Defiance County. Um, right by uh, St. Michael's there. It's, it's in front of the, the church in the background. Uh, other areas, you know, more commonly, people have ponds in Defiance County and um, throughout Northwest Ohio because the dense clay soils, it, you know, you just got to kind of dig a hole and it'll pond up pretty much. And uh, I mean, it's a little more than that, but um, you can, you know, naturalize the shoreline of these. They don't have to look like the picture on the left. Um, it's actually not Defiance County, okay, but the one on the right is our farm in Defiance, and uh, you can you know plant native plants along the shore, which provide shade for fish. You can stock the ponds with fish, um, you know bass and bluegill mixtures. Really good uh, fish habitat, as well as um, you know for birds and other other critters. There's some other you know birds that you might try to attract. Is a barred owl, is a little common owl in Ohio. Um, Ohio Division of Wildlife has a lot of good information on type of habitat they use, uh, you know, leaving old old forest um, as well, you know, standing in dead wood can be useful for a lot of owls and other species like woodpeckers. You can even get some, uh, what used to be unusual in Northwest Ohio, sandhill cranes, you know, we never saw any at our, our farm for uh, ever until, uh, you know, just maybe five, a few years ago, they started showing up occasionally. Um, they, yeah, so the, Kind of a benefit of having these wet areas. They're more common in Michigan. Um, we are starting to get them here. Really cool birds. You know, and uh, so also just a little bit more on the where here. You don't have to take out whole fields things to do these projects. You know, you can just um, do some plantings on the edge of your fields. Uh, you know, between the ditches and the fields, you can do native plantings. There's what they call buffer programs, um, which Josh will talk a little bit more about. It's a good area to do native um, pollinator plantings. There's a variety of spaces in between the farmland where you can actually try to do do things. These show some of those some of those opportunities. Uh, you can also manage the water better. This is more for water quality. Um, but things like two stage ditches, where you modify the ditch to make it more environmentally friendly, you can then create a habitat area on the old benches shown there, um, more of a kind of a wetland kind of alongside the ditch, and then prairie strips or strips of native plants kind of it and uh, points along the field where it'll help capture water and nutrients, but also uh, you have native planting in there. So good pollinators um, and other wildlife. 
this is a picture of some buffers and some of the um, this is from uh, some of the codes that the uh, different agencies use to describe these practices. Um, and Josh will talk more about that. So I'm not going to go into the details of the government programs here, but just a couple more options here and then uh, some tips and then we go on from there. But, uh, you know, aside from just kind of wild plantings uh, of native species, you can also do like perennial crops, things like root trees, apple, pear, um, or nut crops like walnut, hazelnut, hybrid uh, chestnuts, which provide a can be crops that you know people would use, but uh, you know it also then create often better wildlife habitat. Even like hay, which is a perennial crop, so it'll grow back each year, um, and you know you're not having bare soil each spring. Often provides habitat for a number of birds and things. So so that's kind of an in between where you can still have a crop, still have kind of better wildlife habitat. I have some information here from Iowa State Extension. Um, a little more information on the walnuts. And then I just I have here some uh, general tips which uh, I found uh, on the on the web. Uh, you know, and I won't go through all these, but um, you know, just some little simple things uh, you can do is just you know limiting the amount of lawn you have, so you don't have to you know like create like a ten acre wetland, but you can just take you know like two hundred square feet of your lawn and plant native plants in there, and it'll create habitat for birds, butterflies, and so forth. Um, that's one of the easy things you can do. You can also leave snags or pile, brush piles that are habitat for some birds and wildlife uh, and areas where there's water. Uh, and then also this vertical layering, I'll show just a couple pictures of that. You can do things like raise beds, which help plants to grow earlier in the year. Um, so the soil warm up faster, they can start growing uh, earlier. And it's you know, also easier to control the weeds. Um, the other thing about this is it's nice to have a variety of different heights of plants just for different, you know, uh, birds, insects, etc. So, you know, ground layer things, this picture shows like, um, you know, mosses and grasses and then get into uh, shrubs, which are kind of, you know, small woody plants and larger trees. But it's nice to have a variety of, you know, ground layer and then tree and canopy kind of species. Um, all right. And, you know, you can look at your property and develop a landscape plan. This is an example of a farm from Northwest Ohio. They say most of it's farmland, but they've done a lot of you know tree plantings uh, in their uh, kind of homestead area. So you know it's a good idea to look at this and maybe talk to you know your local SWCD or if you have some other plant expert or wildlife expert you can talk to to help develop a plan. I uh, definitely recommend that. It doesn't have to be a complicated. Just you know drawing a sketch of your property and where you're going to put things on a on a map. It's helpful to sort of plan it out. Um, you know, some other things you can do, uh, providing bird bat houses, bird feeders. Um, even, you know, you put out hummingbird feeders, you can attract hummingbirds. It's nice to, you know, bring those in and have the opportunity to see those. And then um, other things, you know, removing the non-native plants, especially if they're invasive, things like Canada thistle, um, you know, that are real problematic. It helps to remove those and get native perennial plants that can cover that ground and then prevent invasive invasion in the future. Uh, these are some other things I won't talk about those much. Manage pets, that's um, something like with cat. Cats will actually, if left out, can kill a lot of birds. So that's one example of like managing pets um, for wildlife. All right, and then lastly here, I just have a few um, few pictures here of, uh, you know, it's finding native plant suppliers. I, I just got this map off the internet. As you can see, there's not a lot of native plant suppliers really close to Defiance County. I did. Um, there are around Toledo and then further south and east and up in Michigan. I do point out this one that I've used, this uh, Riverview Native Nursery, which is near uh, Fort Wayne, which is a good supplier in native herbaceous and woody plants. Um, but I said, there's a number of places you can find, especially the, the trees and shrubs are a little easier to find suppliers for. And you just have to kind of check that what they're selling is in fact native. Sometimes they'll sell plants that sound just like the native variety, but it might be some hybrid that they've developed that comes from another part of the world. And so you want to pay attention to that and try to get good, you know, local native plants if possible. Um, all right, yeah, that's actually all the information I have and I'll stop and pass it over to Josh. Hi, Josh. Do you want to talk a little bit about your experience as a as a service provider with 
landowners, uh, just give us some details on if, if you are a landowner and you're interested in um, either entering into a program that can compensate you for planting wildlife habitat or or not, what the person might, uh, the steps they would take to be able to do that. Sure. So a, a little bit of my background, um, I've, I've got to see this a little bit from every side. So currently I work for the Williams Hill and Water uh, Conservation District. Uh, worked, I have background in uh, wildlife management in general. So I went uh, out of college, went to Michigan, worked for the Department of Natural Resources up there for six years uh, before returning back to Ohio. Um, I've also worked on the private side, uh, giving recommendations on uh, to private landowners on the private side as well. So I got to see it a little bit from every angle. And as Stephanie said, I also um, currently on the family ground, uh, also in Defiance County, uh, we're, we're going through a CRP CREP uh, wetland um, installation currently, and it's actually just ended last week, the uh, construction portion of it, and we'll be doing a, a fall planting uh, this year. So uh, got to see it a little bit from every side. Um, but I would say in general, what, what you're going to want to do, there's different options. So you can talk to your local soil and water conservation districts. Um, not every uh, soil and water will have a wildlife um, specialist on board. Some do, some don't. Um, you can also talk to the ODNR. Um, they have private lands biologists that can come out and uh, kind of analyze your property, give you options. Um, you can talk with the local NRCS, um, FSA as well. But what you're going to see is a lot of times if you go directly to like NRCS, um, you're going to have their programs um, that they're going to uh, bring up to you. If you go to FSA, they're going to talk CRP programs that they offer. So you, one thing that I Sorry I've for noticed, interrupting, but can you can you say what FSA and NRCS and CRP yes. is? Because people, some, you know, they're, they're acronyms that we use all the time, but if you're unfamiliar. Yep. So NRCS is the Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, and they offer programs like EQIP, which again, uh, Environmental Quality Incentive Program, um, CSP, Conservation Steward Stewardship Program, um, and then FSA is Farm Service Agency, um, and they offer programs like CRP, um, Conservation Reserve Program. Um, all of these work in different ways and offer different benefits, also have different drawbacks with them, um, where if you talk to someone like um, your the ODNR, um, Ohio Division of Wildlife, um, they have private lands biologists that come out, they can walk your property, analyze it, see where your downfalls are, sit, maybe talk with you and see what benefits um, you want to see on your property. That's also what I do as a wildlife specialist here in Williams County. Um, but they can get you in contact with different funding sources. So there's grants, um, many different grants, which we apply for um, to get these projects done. Um, there are, there's the CRP option, which allows you uh, annual payment um, and some cost share. Um, and then EQIP, which has more of a cost share, but no annual payment with it. Um, so that's where it can get a little overwhelming if you go in and you know, you're offered a thousand options. Um, but what we can do is we'll walk you through that um, one program at a time, um, set you down, have, have that conversation of the pros and the cons of each of those programs and find something that actually fits the landowner. So, and I think that's the biggest thing is you got to find something that's going to fit what works you know, on your farm, in your area. Um, one thing that we've been uh, working with a lot too with landowners is, um, as Chris brought up, is it doesn't have to be a whole field um, type program. Um, we're working with um, a lot with precision ag and finding those areas in the field that maybe aren't as productive and turning that into, you know, if it's a wet spot in the field, maybe a wetland program, right? Um, and again, there's multiple options that you can go to in that situation um, to provide funding or maybe you don't want funding at all and you just wanna know how to get that done 
privately, you know, through your own dollars, which is an option as well. So um, we can just discuss those options. And so can ODNR and some of these other uh, specialists in your area. So. So um, something that we haven't really mentioned, but um, I think is worth note mentioning, and by the way, ODNR is Ohio Department of Natural Resources. So yep. it's another state agency that has some mon money through a program called H2 Ohio to fund wetlands. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about like, well, you already, you already did talk about um, that people should be coming, going to their local soil and water district or their, local USDA office, wherever that might be. Um, and it sounds like in most places, you might find someone who can help you with this, but if you can't, you can always contact us and we can get you, we could start to explore those options for you where you are located. Um, I'm just looking at some of my my questions. One of the things we had, we talked about the benefits, we talked about of creating wildlife habitat and the wildlife that you might see, not only mammals, but lots of um, fish, reptiles, insects, birds. Um, and we all already talked about the importance of choosing native species, which if you do work with a professional, a resource professional, they'll be able to tell you what those native species are that not only work for where you live, but the soil that you are located in. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, invasive species? Because that's something that I think if you're if you're trying to take something from farm ground to our native species, you're going to deal with invasives. Yeah, both invasives and noxious species um, here in Northwest Ohio are abundant um, and can be really a money pit when it comes to um, trying to manage for native habitats. Um, some of the big ones we see um, up here in Northwest Ohio, autumn, autumn olive as a big one, especially if you're trying to establish grasslands. Um, uh, bush honeysuckle is a big one in timber that we see, uh, occasionally uh, privet, um, and then noxious and invasive species in your fields as well. You know, you've got your teasel, which is, if you, if you ever drive through Defiance County, I think is the county weed at this point, um, but also you know, the thistle, things like that. And it really be, becomes an issue when, if, if you let it get started on the property or if you don't um, establish in, uh, a good way to start, it can, it can really just cost a lot of money to try to fight that over the, over the years once it's in there. So one thing that we uh, try to harp on early is just getting it established the right way, trying to take care of those um, and try to minimize the opportunity for those to get established on your property. Um, there are funding options, again, for removing invasive species um, through EQIP, the uh, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, through NRCS. Um, so there are options as well to help fund fighting invasive species as well. Um, but it's, it's a big deal. It's something that um, through the state, we we fought for a long time, and I can tell you, it it, it can get costly and it can um, cause issues, and that can be just from farming too. I mean, not just trying to establish native habitats, but you can have these pop up farming. You can have them uh, come in if you have your property logged at any point. Um, so there's a lot of avenues for these to get into your property, but there's a lot of avenues to get rid of them as well. So. Don't feel overwhelmed by it, um, but come talk to a resource professional um, and we can identify those for you. We can uh, find solutions for that. I'm gonna throw in one thing. Um, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment, but it's kind of a question. So essentially you all talked about different things um, regarding agroforestry and like things like chestnut production and riparian um, zones and also CRP and you know the different types of wildlife you can bring onto your farm. One interesting example I've recently found out is with the Southern Ohio Chestnut Company. Um, what they're doing out there is growing chestnuts, obviously, and it's an agroforestry practice. And so what they have an idea of, since it takes about 10 years for those chestnuts to get to economic production, in the meantime, leasing that land out to 
deer hunters um, because they have both trees and shrubs and it's essentially that vertical layering that makes the deer, deer feel um, like it's okay to go forage there but they also have crp grounds with prairie strips and native plants where the deer feel comfortable bedding and so it's like a way of stacking enterprises where you have like crp going but you're also getting um money from these i don't really know anything about hunting i don't know who these deer hunters are but do you have any idea of, like who these people are how you can find them like other options outside of these USDA programs that people can go to when it comes to um, capitalizing off the wild life that might be on their land. Yeah, so there's there are companies um, that are re in reputable companies that that do leasing programs um, on your land, and it is a way to make some money. Um, again, you know, a lot of farmers in Northwest Ohio, is, especially, um, they kind of set that woods aside and they don't really pay attention to it. Um, but even ones that do, I mean, you can, you've got wildlife on there and you can make a little bit of money um, through that. Um, one thing you want to make sure of in those situations is um, in some of the, the more reputable leasing agencies do this is uh, they offer insurance and basically an insurance on your land as well. So if they get hurt on your land or anything like that, that's something you want to make sure you're covered on as well. Um, but it is, it is, it's a great way to capitalize on ground that otherwise you're not making any money on or stacking, like you said, if you're growing chestnuts and, and the deer are in there, might as well utilize it, so. Did people have any questions from the- Yeah, audience? are there are there any questions for Chris or Josh? We could probably take one or, one or two questions if you have any. Um, I'm going to be honest, I, I, I'm not a landowner. I don't have uh, large areas to be able to do things like this. Um, I just wanted to hear, uh, you know, what people in my area are thinking about doing, because uh, I do, I am located in Ohio where there's a lot of farmland and I just want to see what those owners are thinking about um, trying to incorporate the local wildlife and other plant species. So that's why I'm joining you. So thank you for just sharing what you know. Yeah, thanks. Josh, you had mentioned putting your email into the chat. So if, if you put that into the chat for anyone who's watching this video, we'll make sure that that pops up for them. And I think if there's no more questions, um, we will thank our speakers, Josh and Chris, and thank our participants for coming. And I hope everyone has a fabulous day.